Arnold Barnes, Jr., who is the senior scientist out of Phillips Laboratory. Now, again, this was delivered in 1997, and it's important to understand that uh, since 1997, uh, and the fact that this technology is well over 20 years old, uh, this uh, weather uh, modification and control is accomplished by ground level, horizontal hidden antennas and or large space platforms that are nuclear powered. So we have an advanced weapons system in place now. But this is back in 1997. And this is, uh, this is horrific, and uh, I'll just read a couple of things in this document. They talk about the treaty issues on page 3, and they say the UN Convention on the Prohibition of Military or Any Other Hostile Use of Environmental Modification, which went into effect October 5th of 1978, applies only to widespread, long-lasting, or severe environmental modifications. In other words, there was a UN treaty back in 78 that prohibited the continued use of widespread and long-lasting environmental modifications. They go on to say that local Non-permanent changes, such as precipitation, in other words, creating rain enhancement, and hail and fog and cloud dispersal, are permitted under the UN Treaty of 1978. They go on on page four to talk about the weather modification capabilities back then. Um, degrade enemy forces, create precipitation enhancement, flood the lines of communication and reduce reconnaissance effectiveness, decrease comfort level, and also decrease morale. Storm enhancement, which would deny operations. Now we're talking about operations here right now in the United States and globally. Look at what is happening to Texas right now. This is weather weapons, this is war. Precipitation denial. We're seeing that now here in California. They told us then, inducing a drought, denying fresh water. Space weather. Disable and destroy space assets. Fog and cloud removal or fog and clouds being used as concealment. They could do either. Now we have to think about that. There's huge profits in causing fog, um, and insurance companies make a tremendous amount of money in impairment of vision on our highways. And sadly, this is another method of market uh, increase and revenue increase. For those that don't know what HARP is, it's an ionosphere heater. That's part of these programs. So as they spray these particulates, it makes the atmosphere more conductive, more electrically conductive, these are incredibly huge and powerful ground-based facilities that they use to manipulate these particulates. So when you have the polarization of these particulates that's sensitive to radio frequency, they can cause those particulates to scatter out and cover the sky, or they can cause them to attract and come together and form big enough condensation nuclei to cause rain. Again, playing God with the weather with extremely toxic materials. That facility can put out about 3 billion watts of power, billion with a B. Uh, it's capable of heating the ionosphere to 15,000 degrees Fahrenheit over areas hundreds of square miles. What they're doing to our climate system is beyond science fiction, but it's fact. This looks like something from a science fiction movie. That's the same type of facility on a mobile platform. It's called SBX radar, sea-based X-band radar, for the same purpose, manipulating the climate system. This more elaborate figure likewise on a steel plate, is also produced by vibration. The exciting crystal is attached to the upper corner of the plate. We use sand and lycopodium. The lycopodium moves to the center of the fields and takes up circular shapes. The sand forms the lines. Each material has its own special way of behaving.
micropodium alone, a sonorous figure, transition to a mobile flowing phase, and back again to the figure. The sonorous figures represent stationary waves, but now we can also observe moving waves. Here, the sand is flowing in a current. When the wavelengths are short, these currents produce a rotary effect. Areas become defined in which the particles are actually rotating. capability of, of actually smelling and tasting these things in the air. In fact, that's when I first woke up to this, is I uh, started tasting very salty, metallic taste in the air and had terrible inflammation, pain, headache, um, all kinds of symptoms that came over me within a period of about 10 or 15 minutes, which I'd never experienced anything like this before. And the taste and the symptoms all coincided and I looked outside and saw these big plumes in the, uh, across the sky that had been there for about an hour. And that is, that's what woke me up to this. And I will tell you that uh, the scents and the tastes that we experience, those of us who, who are sensitive that way, there are many. Um, around between 7 or 10 at night, and the time varies, um, they'll throw something down or something reaches ground level, I should say, uh, around that time that causes terrible inflammation and tastes like a pharmaceutical drug mixed with some kind of really bitter herb taste. I don't know, I don't know what this stuff is, um, but it causes me to have dramatic inflammation. And I've seen other people have symptoms where they get nauseous, they get headaches, they get joint muscle pain, some of those symptoms I have as well. Um, we have clouds in the sky we've never seen before. Almost every day I'm seeing clouds I've never seen before. And NASA has been even named a few of these new clouds. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting, but NASA is a corporation. I want you to know that. Uh, NASA has also uh, conducted a research program in what they call metallized fuels. We're actually putting aluminum oxide right in the fuel because it has two atoms of aluminum and three atoms of oxygen. So during the combustion process, it releases all that oxygen and dramatically increases efficiency, but it leaves the aluminum in the air. We got things coming from sky down, and it's a huge, huge problem. Because as it comes down, what happens is a couple of things. Is that it actually is in our air, we breathe it. And as we breathe it, it's actually going to go up through our nostrils, into our brain, easiest access to our brain frontal lobe. The contaminants that are in, that have been identified, which have already been mentioned, are aluminum. Aluminum is the number one neural uh, free radical generator to the brain to cause early apoptosis, which is early death of brain, and it begins to set off the scar tissue, which we call the amygdalin, which is, a pot, which is part of the um, chemical matrix related to Alzheimer's. I'm a neurologist practicing in Reading for 17 years. And in the past five years, I've seen the number of patients with Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, and other neurodegenerative diseases tremendously increase, almost quadruple. Uh, I became interested in chemtrails about eight years ago when I was in Hawaii, and the Hawaiians are really being very vocal about it. I concur about the increase in number of Alzheimer's. They have been able to take the aluminum and micronize it.